What's up, everybody? Welcome. It is the Vegas Take Sharp and Shapiro brought to you by the Wager Fund. And we're going to have a lot of fun today. Glad you could join us. We've got some great guests lined up. Not like there's much going on in the sports world right now. Now, it's just Game 7 of, of the Eastern Conference Finals. That's all. The Western Conference Finals, Game 7 tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And by the way, oh, yeah, we have something called the Stanley Cup Finals. That's right down the road. And me and J.D. will be attending tomorrow. No big deal. Just, you know, just a first-year expansion franchise in the Stanley Cup Finals. That's all. Not much going on. J.D., how's your weekend, my friend? A lot going on in the world of sports. There's a ton going on, and I'm really, really excited to attend the Stanley Cup tomorrow. Oh, it's uh, going to be it's awesome. Gonna, it's going to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience, uh, to say the least. We, it, there's no question about it. It's going to be incredible, and we'll get to that in a second here. Let me just line up some of the guests we're going to have today. Coming up at 6.30... Uh, this is a guy that former coach at UNLV. Uh, I, I, I don't. I've never really heard anyone say any, one negative thing bad about this guy. He's just a class act. He is one of the best coaches in the country, no doubt about it. He made the Final Four a few years ago. The head coach of Oklahoma, former UNLV running Rebel head coach Lon Kruger. He'll be joining us at six thirty. Talk a little coaches versus cancer. How much money that uh, he's helped raise for cancer research. That was just in town over the last week. So we'll talk to Lon Kruger. That'll be fun coming up at six thirty. Coming up in just about ten minutes from now. Another thing happening in Vegas, everything happens here, it seems, the World Series of Poker. And uh, that was just underway. And the guy who's, I don't want to make him sound old or anything, but he's been uh, broadcasting the World Series of Poker for ESPN for a very, very long time. When he started, I had hair on my head. That's long gone. Norman Chad will be joining us in just a few minutes. Norm's a really funny guy. And uh, we'll get to that coming up in a little bit. So a lot going on, as I said, J.D., in the world of sports. But again, uh, you know, we're driving to the station today. And I said to you, I'm like, is this really happening? Are we really going to the Stanley Cup Finals tomorrow? Is this first-year expansion franchise really playing with home ice in Game 1? We know our buddy Danny Negreanu will be there. He's psyched up for it. A lot of people are. There are parties all over Las Vegas tomorrow. But, And I have this argument or debate, if you will, with people. I think if, if the Knights win the Stanley Cup, I think it's the best story in the history of sports. That's just my opinion. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? There's a lot. Obviously, Jackie Robinson breaking the the barrier in Major League Baseball is huge, but the, that's a different story. And then there's there's so many great stories. You could talk about Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas. I mean, there, but to me, this is obviously the best story in the history of the NHL. That that to me, that's not a debate. But I think it is. It will be if they win the Stanley Cup, the best story in the history of, of sports as we know it. I think it has to be considered the fact that the expectations were so low. The team was created in, as Negreanu kind of uh, referenced last week, kind of a money ball style with focusing on speed uh, through their centers and just being faster and honestly having a chip on their shoulder, especially after what took place um, with the shooting here in mm-hmm. Las Vegas. I mean, that the fact that in the same year this team – in this city, surrounded by a desert in an ice sport, is going to be in the Stanley Cup Finals. I mean, that's that's pretty tough to top. And I'm and I'm, I'm with you, Brian. I think I'm, I think that there's a there's a very good chance that this could be the biggest story in sports if they do in fact win it all. And even if they don't win the Stanley Cup, uh, I said them just making the playoffs is an unbelievable accomplishment for a first year expansion team. But you know, to do what they did to the Kings, to the Sharks. And I thought they were going to lose this last series. And I was at, to Winnipeg. I was absolutely wrong. But I, I'm picking them to win it all uh, from a gambling perspective. And this is, uh, you know, we do talk a little gambling. Of course, the Wager Fund sponsors this show. The spread, the series price, which means, you know, picking which team to win. This, uh, you know, will it be the Knights or, of course, will it be the Capitals? The series is around, uh, last I saw, about minus 160. The the money line tomorrow for the game is around minus 145. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think it depends on Mark andre Fleury. If he if he plays as well as he's played, the Knights have a very, very good shot of winning. But if he, if he slips up, I think the Capitals have a good shot of winning. So we'll, well what see. Was the, the thing is, though, when was the last time he slipped up? I mean, this guy has been unbelievable, not just throughout the playoffs, but all year long. I mean, this is a guy that was a backup goalie for, for the most part, his last job. And now he is the best goalie by percentage in the entire NHL, facing off against the second best goalie. This is an unbelievable matchup. If you're the NHL, you could not be happier. You have Alex Ovechkin, who is going to be one of the top 10 players of all time. I think that's fair to say. They finally make it to a Stanley Cup final. You saw the relief on his face when they won the Eastern Conference finals. So you have the Caps 
going up against a first-year expansion franchise in Las Vegas. If you're the NHL, I don't think you could have asked for more uh, as far as this matchup is concerned. Yeah, I mean, Ovechkin, he's never won one before. He's definitely at least a top-20 player, possibly a top-10 player. And Fleury's got all the experience. And, and these and these knights, these knights are hungry. They're hungry, they're fast, and they're really well coached. Yeah, uh, Gallant is is an unbelievable coach. I cannot believe that Florida, you know, what they gave us a couple great players and, and a great coach on top of it. But I think I think tomorrow is going to say a lot in the series. When you look at the Stanley Cup Finals, usually the team that wins Game One is the team that wins the series, and that's that's usually the case in all the NBA Finals in the World Series. Usually, the team that wins that first game usually it doesn't happen all the time, but usually, statistically speaking, is the team that wins. Now, Vegas has had some time to rest. They did not have to play a Game 7. And, you know, Washington, they looked like they were pretty spent after that Game 7 win. That was an emotional win for them. I'm really curious to see how both teams come out tomorrow. And we will be there. We will find out. Game time is 5 o'clock, and it's going to be a I, I just can't imagine the environment. You know, the pregame for these games, are, it, it's like a show in itself. You said it's like a almost like a circus. Yeah, because you haven't been to a game all year. No, I have never. I never. That's have. a pretty good game you're going to tomorrow. Yeah. Not it's a bad a, game. It's an okay game. Just to give you an idea about how much these tickets are going for, a season ticket holder at the beginning of the year paid somewhere around fifteen hundred dollars for some seats. Those were the cheapest. Fifteen hundred dollars for upper section seats. Tomorrow you're lucky to find one seat in the arena, one game for less than that. You'll be lucky. I go on Craigslist, everything's, you know, over $1,000. And if you want to sit behind the glass or in the lower section, well, good luck. If you want to sit next to Derek Stevens, it's going to cost you, like, you know, probably five, ten grand. But uh, it, it really is incredible. And a couple of winners. It'll require to give you a couple of winners as yes, well. Yes, that's right. Uh, you know, all the, all the Vegas celebrities are going to be there. I cannot wait to see the pregame. I cannot wait to see how loud it is in that arena. And it has been so loud throughout the year. The playoffs, this crowd has been incredible. The atmosphere, the energy in the arena at T-Mobile has been unbelievable. I can't even imagine what it is going to sound like in there tomorrow when they drop the puck, man. It's going to be, it is going to be incredible. And, you know, we're watching history in the making. Speaking of history, I should probably give you a quick update here on this one. Celtics in Cleveland, Game 7 going on as we speak. Of course, we don't want you to turn us off and turn that on. So I'll give you an update Celtics up by eight early, 28 to 20, 28, 20 with about 11 minutes left to go. They just started the second quarter. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we have the Western Conference Finals game seven. We're going to get into that later. And I actually want to ask Lon Kruger, who, uh, of course, used to coach in the NBA. I want to ask him, does he follow the NBA still? And, and what does he think about uh, these lopsided games, man? It's really weird. These, these games. I mean, we have competitive series right in the NBA. But a lot of these games are blowouts, and I don't think that's good for the NBA. Well, it's it's all about the three ball. The team that makes their threes wins by a lot. The team that misses their threes loses by a lot. That's, that's true. Just, and that's just what it's coming down to. And yesterday, the, the Rockets hit, I think, 14 threes in the first half, and they were up yeah. by 10. And Golden State was maybe 2 of 20 or 3 of yeah, 20, and they came, back, they came out, and I think they won the second half by 35 mm -hmm. points. Nuts. That's absolutely crazy. The, the, the three ball is the, uh, it's, yep. it'll, it'll make or break you. And these teams are three, three point shooting teams. So much going on. NBA, two game sevens, Western Eastern Conference. We've got the NHL Stanley Cup finals tomorrow that you and I will be attending. And I also will be attending. I, I will be playing at a few events as well. And a guy that knows a little bit about poker, I'd say he knows a little bit about the World Series of Poker. As I said, I think this guy on the line right now, he started, I don't want to make Norman Chad sound old, but he's been, he's been broadcasting for ESPN, the World Series Poker, a long time. When he started, I actually had hair on my head. So that was a while ago. And now Norman's one of my favorites. And he joins us right now live on the KDWN Hotline. Norman, thanks so much for coming on, my man. How you doing? I'm fine. You are correct. I, I do know only a little bit about poker. <laughs> but you're incorrect about how old I am. I've been doing it for 15 years, okay? Marv Albert was has been doing the NBA since the 1960s. So there's a difference. <laughs> And you haven't had some of the issues away from the away from poker commentator that Marv has, so let's not compare you to him. Let's 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 definitely. I do have all my own hair. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, you do a great job for the WSOP. So much I want to get into here. We appreciate your time. So everything that I want to start with this: Chris Ferguson, Howard Letterer. We heard the all the rumblings of what happened. Uh, you know, when when those guys played in the WSOP last year, some mixed emotions from players and fans. What did you think of? Uh, Jesus Ferguson's 44-second apology on uh, online, and uh, the poker community doesn't seem very happy with him right now. 
Yeah, they haven't been happy with him, obviously, since the whole full tilt blow up. And uh, you know, I, I've given Chris, and I still give Chris the benefit of the doubt because we don't know what went on there. But Chris is really, if, if, if he's innocent and he doesn't have much to do with it, he really hasn't handled himself in the best fashion. Uh, I, I wish he would have been more forceful in dealing with it at the outset. He's had plenty of opportunities to talk about it since then. And then finally, as you just mentioned, a 44-second uh, online apology, which was as wooden and teleprompters as could be. It just it, it, There was no sincerity to it. There was, no, there was mm. absolutely no human element to it. And the online and the poker community is just going to blast him for it. So I will still continue to say this, Brian. We don't know what Chris's role was. Uh, and so I, I think that people have drawn conclusions on, on facts that they do not have. But Chris certainly hasn't helped himself with his That's reaction. That's fair. No, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. You know, poker has changed so much over the years, Norm. And uh, when, you, when you first started commenting on the WSOP, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, the average age, average age was probably guys over 40, over 50. I don't think I'm, I think that's, that's probably pretty accurate. Now you got all these young guns, all these young kids, kids in their early 20s, you know, kids, the internet players, and, and so on and so forth. Have you had to change the way you commentate poker just based on the, the personalities and the type of play that you see at the table these days? Well, I haven't had to change uh, as far as the strategy goes, since I don't deal with strategy, Brian. I haven't had to change the commentary in that regard uh, because I don't deal with strategy. But you are correct. Uh, you know, we had an older crew uh, that used to play, which also had more backstories and were more interesting. Now it's everybody who's had a laptop in front of them since they were a teenager. So that has affected and, and actually uh, it's actually hurt me in terms of my commentary because we don't know as much about them. They don't have interesting stories. They don't talk at the table. So it makes it, it more difficult since I'm just looking for the entertainment value and, and right. for other stories so yeah it's they're tremendous they're tremendous poker players they're better than the generation that preceded them they have actually figured it out at many many different levels but they are difficult to commentate on if you're just joining us we're speaking with norman chad a longtime broadcaster for espn for the world series of poker norm that's a good segue to my next question you talk about people that entertain at the poker table and i don't think this is necessarily anyone's fault but you know the world poker tour not great ratings anymore and everybody used to watch the world poker tour you guys used to broadcast what seven eight tournaments at the world series of poker now it's what one or two and I, I like i said i don't think that's anybody's fault i think you guys do a great job uh with covering the world series of poker but do you think a part of that is due to the fact that we're not getting those personalities at the tables anymore and when you have larger fields chances are you're probably not going to get those household names anymore and i don't think and correct me if i'm wrong norm but i don't think that the casual poker fan the casual fan wants to see a bunch of 22, 23-year-old Internet kids that don't talk at the table and, and quite frankly, I don't, I don't have the personalities that a Phil Hamath or a Mike Mattisau has. No, you're correct. Uh, the casual fan, and, and, and especially when we're on ESPN, we want the casual fan. Uh, they're not as interested in seeing a 24-year-old you know, Internet sensation who has headphones on and a hoodie <laughs> and sunglasses right. and doesn't talk. <laughs> Well, so that hurts us. But what, what hurt us more, actually, Brian, again, was, was Black Friday and losing online poker. Right. So right. That, that's why you see so much less poker on TV now. And now, uh, even though on ESPN, like, you know, all we do, we do the, well, during the main event again live this year, uh, every day for the second straight year, besides the, the tape broadcasts, there is Poker Central now. And so Poker Go and Twitch TV will do, all, all the, uh, you know, dozens of final tables from the World Series. It's a subscription service, Poker Go, or you can watch them on Twitch TV. But, yeah, we have been hurt uh, by the, the lack of online poker. And then when we do have it on ESPN, it's a lot better to have personalities and well-known people. But personalities, whether they're well-known or not, and most of this 20-something generation just doesn't have the personality. Do you think the World Series of Poker can do anything to change that? For example, it, it seems to me, like a guy like a William Kasouf, who I'm sure you would agree is entertaining to watch with his speech play at the table, but it seems like the World Series of Poker, they, they don't want that. They don't want table talk. They actually ask, you know, for the most part, they, they kind of attract you away from doing something like that. Don't you think that also hurts the game, that if somebody is heads up against another player, don't you think for the most part they should be able to say whatever they want? No, you shouldn't be able to swear at a player. You shouldn't be able to threaten a player. You shouldn't make it personal, but maybe you should be allowed at times to maybe needle someone or induce action if it's one player versus another, because I think the general public wants to see more of William Kasuf set the table. 
Oh, for sure. And so when it's heads up, you actually should be able to say just about anything you want as long as, you, obviously, you're not being you know, profane or offensive and all right. that. And the World Series has to toe a, a difficult line here because they, they, they're trying to do what's fair for all players, but they also want what you're talking about. They actually do want, obviously, they, they want an audience. They want more people to be interested in it. And so they're not trying to turn off people. So they do, you know, they do like the table talk, but you know, there are tournament director association rules in regards to what you can do. They can adjust those rules if they want, but uh, they're trying to follow those rules, and they're also trying to bring in more viewers. It's, it's, it's a, they're in a tough position, actually. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. So give me some picks here. I mean, I know it's, it's pretty difficult to pick who's going to win the main event of the World Series of Poker, but maybe some younger, up-and-coming players that maybe most people have not heard of yet or people that you think have a great chance to at least maybe win a bracelet or two this year and, and kind of break through. Well, without giving you a single name, and I'll give you some names, one of the ongoing stories the last five years in poker is how unbelievably talented the young German players are. These guys are at a different level. It's a huge colony of Germans, and Fader Holtz is probably the best known of them, and he's a delightful personality, and he's very young, and he just has a great game. So I would look for you know, get young Germans to be you know always – a threat to win bracelets, always going deep in the main event. They're, they're actually some of the best high roller players in the, in the world. So the, the young Germans play in all these $100,000 buy-ins and do incredibly well. And so uh, Federholtz is the best known of them, but there's, there, there are about a dozen of them that are worth watching. And the other notable thing for this year's World Series is we're told that Phil Ivey is returning to, to the World Series. I don't know how many events he's going to play. He's certainly going to play the main event. Uh, I assume he'll play the 50K uh, poker players, and I assume he'll play the $1 million one drop at the end. But he, he was absent of it. Uh, I have, he, he's always my guy. I made him dead to me because he just stopped coming to the World Series. He's still dead to me till I see him at the World <laughs> Series. And he doesn't even speak to me, but he's dead to me. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> All right. I'm setting the over-under Vegas line of how many events Norman Chad plays in the World Series of Poker at two and a half. Do you think that's a fair line. Yeah, so you know you're, you're smarter than I look because that's a very fair line. Uh, I normally play three, four, or five, and this year just because of work obligations and stuff, it looks like I will be playing only two or three. So I don't know how you knew that. Uh, you, you know, you don't have that much <laughs> formal education. I know people. Okay, Norm, sort of I street smart, but yes, that's a pretty good line. Two and a half. I what know people. Line for how many I cash, and you can't even find a number for that. I'm going like to say a, a half a of an event, number. a half, point five, a half. So it's like <laughs> even money over. Uh, you've cashed in the main. You've cashed in the WSOP before, though, haven't you? Yeah, I've cashed uh, four times. That's uh, impressive. In, in events, in about forty or forty-four tries. I, I'm happy to say I played in one event and I cashed in one event, so I'm 100 percent on that. You cannot get any better than that, as you know. <laughs> okay, here's one. Here's a here's a controversial question for you. So when you guys put up on TV, say a guy played in, uh, you put up a, a stat. You know, I don't know. Net, Daniel Negreanu has won eight million dollars in WSOP earnings, or you know, maybe someone we haven't heard of, uh, four hundred thousand in earnings. Don't you think you guys should also put up? Well, how many events have they played in and they lost, and and, and put that into account? Because don't you think at times it could be misleading when you say, "Well, this guy has won seven million dollars in WSOP earnings, but the guy's lost in four hundred tournaments." You have brought up one of my great pet peeves of the last decade. You're absolutely correct, uh, and certainly I think that the poker world doesn't want you know most people to know that most of these people are losing because most people who do play poker, and certainly most people who play tournament poker, are going to lose. Uh, you only cash out, you know, you only, only 10% or 15% of the field cashes out, so that means 85 to 90% of the field are going home with nothing. But you're absolutely correct. Part of the problem that we can't do it in general is that we don't know people's buy-ins. You know, when we say that somebody's got X amount of earnings, we don't, we don't know what their buy-ins were over right. these. We can do it during a, a single World Series because they're in the computer, I guess. But, yes, you're absolutely correct. When we, when we say what somebody's earnings are, which is why I don't like saying what somebody's earnings are, we don't say what their net is whether right. they won or lost because they might have seven hundred thousand dollars earnings, but they might have, you know, had nine hundred thousand dollars in buy-ins. I wish we could do that. That would be more accurate. That would be less misleading. But we don't do that, and it's, it's un we're unable to do that in general anyway because there's no record of that. We probably could do that for World Series events alone. I'd like to see Hendon Mob showing profits and losses without well. question. I, th I think that, uh, that would make the way real much poker more world. Sense. That, that's what I mean, it's, you know, poker's all about who wins or loses at the end of the day. So earnings means absolutely nothing. You know, you, you yeah. can be the all-time earnings leader and still be a loser for your life. So it, yeah. earnings mean next to nothing to me. Norm, when are we going to get your ESPN earnings? <laughs> <laughs> I am like Donald Trump. 
I do not release my tax return. <laughs> Norm, we love you, buddy. I, I really appreciate you taking some time to join us. You're one of my favorite guys. Uh, you and Gabe Kaplan are, are at my two absolute favorites uh, for poker. You guys are funny, entertaining. You guys obviously understand the game really well. And you, you and Lon, uh, McEachern do a great job. And look forward to seeing you at the, at the WSOP again this year, my man. I appreciate your time. All right, Brian. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Thank that, you, Norm. That is Norman Chad. WSOP commentator for ESPN. Funny guy. Smart guy. Funny guy. And a pretty good poker player, too. If you're cashing in events, you got to know what you're doing, right? Yeah, I mean, 10% is still 10%. That's right. That's right. I, I, I want to get those ESPN earnings from him, though. I want to know what he's making. I, I want to know. I want to know. It's way too much money. Yeah, good thing they don't release my earnings. It'll make Pathetic. you yeah, Good thing they don't release mine. But uh, we got uh, a great guest coming up. Not that Norman was not a great guest. He was. Norman's awesome. But uh, we got uh, Lon Kruger coming up next. He is the uh, former coach of UNLV. So he's going to be joining us coming up soon uh, in a few minutes. And, of course, he made the Final Four at Oklahoma just two years ago. I'm going to ask him a lot of questions. What he thinks about the UNLV program? What he thinks about the state of college basketball? Uh, does he think players should stay more than uh, one, two years? we got a lot to get to with Lon Kruger. And, of course, the Coaches versus Cancer event that you and I attended. We attended one of the events, uh, J.D. It was a lot of fun. So Lon Kruger, the legend himself, will be joining us next right here on The Vegas Take, brought to you by The Wager Fund. <laughs> 